So if you really want to push it, you could say that the hippocampus is kind of like a hard drive. It is really a, a specialized structure for encoding and retrieving information from long-term memory. Uh, but again, you know, synapses are changing throughout all of these different pathways. And there's a very important process of kind of familiarity that we think is supported, especially by these changes in synapses in perirhinal cortex that allow you to say, yeah, that's familiar. I've seen that before. Uh, you can't necessarily kind of fill in all the elaborate details in perirhinal cortex. You just have a more kind of basic, yeah, that seems familiar kind of feeling. Uh, you do seem to need the, the full kind of apparatus of the hippocampus to really complete and fill in all those missing details uh, from a prior memory. Uh, but nevertheless, synaptic, synaptic changes are constantly taking place throughout all of these pathways and supporting some kind of element or trace of memory. And so, you know, whether you kind of think of the hippocampus as like a dedicated hard drive system or kind of just a more specialized version of the same kind of synaptic changes that are taking place elsewhere, you can you can kind of come down on either side of that. But uh, clearly, it's we know from these these amnesia cases that it's really, really important for that really strong ability to encode and retrieve information quickly. And the other thing that makes this happen and that's really important is this notion of sparse activity. Sparse activity is the most important feature of the hippocampus, especially in this dentate gyrus area uh, and also in CA3 that allows you to encode new memories rapidly without suffering from a lot of interference. And so here's kind of the, the diagram for this. In, in, if you have two different memories of two similar events, like what you had for dinner last night versus the night before, for example, there's a lot of similarity in, the, in those representations in cortex. But when you do this process of creating very sparse, very few neurons active at any given point in time, which is driven by the high level of inhibitory GABA circuits in the hippocampus, um, then the odds of the, the kind of neural patterns for these two events uh, overlapping in the hippocampus is reduced kind of in proportion to the size of those circles. So they just have a much less likely chance of overlapping. And if they don't overlap, then different synapses are involved in encoding these two different memories in the hippocampus. And if you use different synapses, you get rid of interference. And so that's really the key thing that you can make relatively rapid synaptic changes here without suffering from a lot of interference to quickly encode new episodic memories in the hippocampus in a way that's very difficult to do directly in the cortex itself. And so evidence in favor of this idea that the hippocampus has really sparse activity uh, is abundant. There's lots of data showing this, but here's just a, a nice little uh, kind of demonstration. This is an eight arm radial maze and a rat is running in and out of these each of these eight different arms and neurons. This is a particular neuron in the CA3 of this rat. This particular neuron just fires in this one particular arm going in one direction and maybe a little bit in this other arm over here. Uh, here in CA1, it's a little bit more distributed. So we have more kind of uh, encoding of these three different arms. But if you look out here in cortex and also subiculum, you see a much broader, much more distributed pattern of activity. So the, so the neurons in interrenal cortex on average are like this, much more kind of likely to be activated, whereas neurons in, in the hippocampus itself proper are much less likely to be active and therefore suffer from much less interference from learning. The critical data for understanding how important the hippocampus is for episodic memory really came from this one patient, H.M. Henry Maliason, who died recently. Um, and he was suffering from intractable epilepsy and the doctors not knowing anything about the hippocampus at that time, kind of remarkably, uh, you know, we've learned a lot in the last 50 years uh, and, and in part, you know, because of HM. So he's kind of a, in some sense, a, a pioneer in this area without ever really knowing that. Um, his case allowed us to understand how important the hippocampus is. So it was removed bilaterally on both sides to, to cure his epilepsy, which it did. 
but it, it we, we then found very quickly that that in fact it, it robbed him of the ability to form new episodic memories um, so he had profound uh, anterograde amnesia so this inability to encode new memories um, he could still learn other things and that was also a big part of what what HM taught us is that you know he could learn to do these kind of procedural tasks and that's kind of what underlies this distinction between uh, episodic memory up here and implicit memory over here in these implicit abilities you know relying on the cerebellum and, and posterior cortical systems in the parietal lobe etc were largely intact and and so this this these kind of learning in these areas is is not affected by damage to the hippocampus um, there's a lot of debate about what happens with semantic knowledge it turns out that there's a population of kids that have uh, uh, neonatal uh, hippocampal damage, um, and those kids actually do end up learning kind of not entirely normal, but largely normal levels of semantic knowledge. And so whereas some people had thought that, in fact, the hippocampus was necessary for learning semantic information, uh, it seems like you can just kind of soak that up in these pathways of the posterior cortex through, again, these more slow, uh, persistent synaptic changes that are taking place with every different experience that you have. Um, and, and really the hippocampus's contribution is much more specific to these episodic memories, this, these kind of specific one-time events that really require this rapid synaptic change without suffering from that kind of interference due to the pattern separation abilities that we see there, the sparse activity. Uh, if you want to see a great uh, media presentation, um, you can uh, watch the movie Memento from Christopher Nolan. Pretty much everybody's aware of these basic contributions of the hippocampus to memory due to these popular accounts. But now hopefully you have a deeper understanding of why the hippocampus is able to do this kind of special role in memory. Just to summarize, this organization of long-term memory can be understood in terms of these uh, organization of these different types of learning uh, that we discussed many times. So the idea that the basal ganglia is specialized for reward learning, the cerebellum's specialized for this kind of motor error-driven learning. Uh, and then here we have again, the hippocampus doing this kind of automatic self-organizing encoding of these episodes as they occur in, in your daily life. Uh, and that being somewhat specialized relative to the rest of the neocortex, which uh, learns, we think, more slowly uh, and is where the, the semantic knowledge is. So if you just want to make that distinction of procedural, that's cerebellum and basal ganglia, this kind of primitive brain system, so to speak. Episodic is the hippocampus. And then semantic consolidated knowledge goes into the neocortex. So that's consistent with that overall organization without requiring us to mention the word consciousness.